Sadly, our long-term loan with the Land Rover Discovery Sport has come to an end. In the three months we've had it, we've done a total of 3,000 k's or a bit over, taken it on the sand, chucked our family in it, chucked our dogs in it, done the whole works. We'll jump in the cabin in detail this time and go for one last spin and give you our final thoughts to see whether it's worth your money. Just to recap, our Land Rover Discovery Sport is an iDynamic SE equipped with the P250 Ingenium petrol engine and 9-speed ZF automatic. The base version of this particular variant starts from $71,232 before on-roads. Our long-termer was spec'd up with a few options at a cost of $12,520. Once inside the Disco Sport, you're instantly greeted with some very nice materials. Up front, we have this white vinyl which continues along the side of the door. Now it's quite textured and three-dimensional with a stitching element, so it definitely adds a bit of premiumness to the cabin. It's complemented by this fine metal mesh trim, which is also textured and three-dimensional, which makes it a bit nicer to look at than some flat black plastic. Another couple of things too. You've got three-seat memory for the passenger seat, and window switch is located up top here. Now that might seem strange at first thought, but it makes a lot of sense because when in the back, it keeps your kids away from playing with them, which is awesome. Another element. We've got soft touch here, soft touch here, soft touch up on the dash, and even down here on the lower center console is also soft. Now a lot of modern luxury cars have a lot of glossy black plastics here which wear quite heavily when you've got heavy traffic from your legs, arms and knees just rubbing against them. On our car however, that doesn't seem to be the case. One of the instant reservations that I had, as did much of the car advice team with this car, is its all white interior. Now we've got a bunch of kids in there, I think three or four children that are under the age of four, so we saw this, these seats and this interior and thought, oh my gosh, it's going to get absolutely trashed. Now first things first, this white area up here, no one really does this unless you're filming a video, so this doesn't really get dirty. But the seats themselves, they require a really diligent maintenance schedule in order to keep them looking as A4 paper white as they currently are. As long as you arm yourself with some good micro suede or Alcantara cleaner and a microfiber cloth, maybe in the glove box, you can ensure that you mop up any stains as soon as they occur. However, you just need to do it on a frequent basis in order to keep them looking schmick. Personally, I would opt for a darker leather or a darker Alcantara or suede, whatever is available, over this white trim if you've got children. Another thing that's quite premium in this cabin is the way things are designed. Now to take these aircon controls for example, these switches, they're minimal and paired back, but they also function incredibly well. You've got fan control, temperature control and seat heating control all on the one switch on either side, which is awesome. On this side, however, you've got terrain control too, which means that you can do three to four functions either side just from one switch. Pretty awesome. One thing that was slightly annoying about this aircon control system, however, was the heating. If you roll it up to high, it instantly jams the fan on high too, which is not what you want. You just ask for a high temperature. So when you're in the morning and you're in a rush, you've got kids in the car and they're freezing and you just want to put the heat on high, you find yourself accidentally, more often than not, getting blown in the face by a really high fan. So just something to note, leave it on 28 and let the fan do its thing normally. Another small gripe with the system is the positioning control for the blower. You have to press this button here in which you get no feedback and then you can change it by the screen. While you're driving, you find that you have to look down, press the button and use the screen. It's just not very intuitive. In some cars, you can get away with just pressing the switch to adjust the fan's position, but sadly, this isn't the case in this car. Now we'll talk a little bit about this car's infotainment system. First things first, and very critical on a large car like this, are its cameras. There are multiple views, top down, 360, left to right side, and a clear bonnet view, which means everything you drive over, you can sort of see what's going on underneath the car if you're off-road. Clarity is great, nighttime visibility is great. Over the life of this load, we've had one small issue with the infotainment system, or more so the camera system, and that our left passenger item has stopped working. What it does, it just shows a black image on the screen regardless of what you're doing. We've tried closing the door, opening the door, cleaning it, everything under the sun, it's just stopped working, which is a bit of a shame. Speaking of cameras, a neat party trick that our car has is this rear view camera that reproduces a rear image from the back up the top. It's a great system. I found that when you've had dogs or rear passengers for that matter, obscuring your rear vision, that this gives you a nice clear line of sight. Also at night, it enables good clear vision out the back too. However, an interesting point, my wife is quite susceptible to motion sickness. She can't use her phone or read while she's in the car as a passenger. And she found this rear view mirror actually triggering the same sort of symptoms. You know, she found it quite hard to, to maintain focus on what she was doing and it found this image a little bit distracting. So interesting point, if you have passengers in the car that might be a little bit susceptible to motion sickness, you might find this not as handy as first thought. Any luxury car should have ample charging points for luxury devices. And a Land Rover is good in that sense. It's also good from a cable management point of view. You've got a wireless charger up front, a USB port here. The infotainment connectivity, however, is in the armrest, and both of these ports are USB 3.0 items, which means they charge your phone in a quick and fast manner. Also a nice point is that you can remove these cup holders to enable a rather large area of storage. 
Let's talk a bit now about the instrumentation and the driver interface. The cruise control system is good. It's a one touch option here and it turns it straight on first time. Increments on the speed increase and decrease however are two kilometers, not one, which can be a bit of a bugbear to some. Over here, however, if you want to change any of the digital instrument display items, such as trip, you have to go into the menu and sort of scroll across and some of the things are a bit buried. So it's a little bit cumbersome to change what you're seeing in front of you and you do have to use this only. There's no single one touch button to do so. You've got some phone Bluetooth controls here, Apple CarPlay controls, voice control, which controls Siri, as well as a favorite switch here, which you can set to be whatever you want it to be. Good thing about this heads up display is that even with a set of polarized sunnies, you can still see it in the broad daylight. I found that some luxury cars and even some mainstream cars for that matter, the heads up displays become invisible when using polarized sunglasses. Moving over to the driver's door here, we've got the window master switch up top, three position memory for the driver's seat. And what I like too heaps is that they've put the lock and unlock for the door near the handle in a very logical position. Given the complexity of Land Rover's option list, we thought it would be best to lay things out for you simply for you to digest. There are certainly important options worth considering, such as keyless entry and some other more trivial items like $400 for DAB radio. We said at the start of this loan that we'll test this car in family duties and I myself have a two year old and I brought my seat along here to show you what the room is like when you've got it in a rearward facing and a forward facing position. Here I have a Britax Griffin convertible seat which goes from zero to four in both rearward and forward facing configurations. At the moment I have it in a forward facing upright configuration and as you can see you've got a good space here from the knee area to the back seat, plenty of room for kids there. A good thing about this car's layout is that whilst enabling ample room for mom and dad in the front, you can have the seat far forward enough where you can put your left leg in and use it to pick the child in and out of and give your back a bit of a rest. A quick note on isofix points for this car. There are only two located on the second row on the outboard seats. The points themselves are really easy to find. Now we did have a question from a couple of readers on whether you can fit child seats to the third row. There is no tether points there, so sadly you can't do that with the Discovery Sport. Now over the time of the loan, I've been driving plenty of other cars from this same segment. And one thing that still surprised me about this Land Rover is its knee room. It's got a fair bit here and this is my driving position. Good foot room too down below and really good headroom. Visibility is great too. You've got these tall doors with lots of glass so you can see everything that's going on and it's a very pleasant place to be. We had three grown adults in the back here and we were all pretty comfortable. We had enough room and we'd be happy to reside here for a little bit of a trip. Another thing too with the 60-40 rear bench is that the back rests actually recline. So if you want to have a bit of a kip, you're more than welcome to. Conveniences in the second row consist of some air vents, a 12 volt port, shame there's no USBs however, a shallow low storage area and extendable back pockets. Now these are great for shoving kids things like bottles, baby wipes, etc. But if you want to keep things out of prying eyes, there's also a storage area in the armrest too. I still maintain that this third row is reserved for younger kids and children only. Now, I'll show you what it's like to get in the back. You've got sort of this room to do it. It's a bit bigger than the Range Rover Sport, but it's still not perfect. I'll show you, I'll try and jump in. So you've got to sort of climb in. Once in the third row, I've still got some knee room here and I've got a fair amount of headroom too. There's some air vents, aircon controls, as well as some cup holders down here too. With the third row up, boot space comes in at 157 litres. You could probably stick a small bag here and get away with it. However, when you drop these seats, you get a great large usable cargo area. It's nice and wide too, so you can throw things in long ways as well as sideways. Another point too, the only way to drop the second row is from here. And once you do, the seats do not fold completely flat however. Now that we've covered the cabin experience, let's go for a drive to see if we've come to love how it behaves on the road. Now, one of the first things that stands out about this Discovery Sport is the way it rides. Now, I've been driving countless cars in this segment over the past couple of months whilst we've had this loan, and one thing that I've been refreshed on every time I jump back in is just how comfortable it is. The suspension is great. It was great off-road on the sand too, so make sure you check out the video. But even around here, around these broken bits of bitumen, it's soft, it's quiet, it's supple, but it does so without sacrificing body control. If you take the thing for a bit of a punt down the back road, you'll find that you won't be wallowing around too much either. It just does a good job of absorbing bumps while maintaining body control, which is basically what you want in a medium SUV. So far, over the period of this three month loan, we've covered 3,279 kilometers, at an average fuel consumption figure of 12.5 and an average speed of 45 k's an hour. Now, that's a bit over four liters against the official claim, which is around 8.1 on the combined figure. Now I said, at the start of this loan that this ZF9 speed transmission is calibrated a little bit interestingly. It seems to keep the revs up high. It doesn't like shifting gears regardless of what you're doing with the TPS. It just holds the revs high. Now that's reflected here in this fuel consumption. Now we generally see one to two liters over the top of an official claim. Seeing four is double that average. Now in our books, as far as we're concerned, that's a bit of a miss when it comes to the economy of this engine. 
This P250 Ingenie mention is a good thing. On the roll, it's got some pace. Off the mark, once it's going, it's quick. And it's pretty flexible all around. It doesn't really run out of puff. It's got a good mid-range, good torque delivery, and you never once find yourself getting caught out or asking for more from it. Now, for this next criticism, I'm actually gonna criticize myself here. Now, initially I critiqued this thing about being a bit wafty around 90 degree left to right turns. Now, I was wrong. When you take this thing off-road, the lack of feel and steering comes in handy navigating soft sand, bad terrain, whatever. It has an ergonomic purpose, and given that I now know that, I'm willing to eat my own words there. I made a mistake, and the steering isn't too bad once you understand and get used to it. I wasn't the only person to spend some time with the Discovery Sport over the duration of the loan. Both managing editor Trent Nikolic and off-road editor Sam Purcell spent some time behind the wheel too. For me, there's one particular brief that I reckon the Discovery Sport really has to fulfil, and that's that feeling of premium. Now, it's hard to define, and it's something that we don't always really describe that well because it's pretty hard to put your finger on exactly what makes a premium car. However, there's a combination of things that I think do it really well inside the Discovery Sport. It's quiet. When you close the door, it's really quiet and insulated inside the cabin. That's a really good thing. And I also think the tech, I think the driver tech, the head-up display, the way Apple CarPlay and that central infotainment screen works, all really add to that feeling of premium and make you feel like you're driving an expensive vehicle. One of my favourite things about this Discovery Sport is certainly the interior. This update has brought a new look, new tech, and there's lots of nice materials around the place. Definitely feels quite premium. Although I have to say, the seat materials for a family SUV probably don't cut it. I found they got dirty very quickly, especially when you've got a couple of kids to wrangle. Unlike most other premium SUVs in this segment, the Discovery Sport does have some decent off-road ability built in. It's not like a Discovery, it's not like a Range Rover, it can't go that hard off-road. But we found on some driving on dirt, through some ruts and on sand, that it was actually quite good once you got to know how to drive the car. This turbocharged petrol engine does have a lot of poke, although I'd like to see it be a little bit more smooth around town and in traffic. I've noticed stopping with auto stop start and hill hold, sometimes you see a gap in traffic. Go to accelerate, and there's a bit of a delay there, which can you leave you looking a bit red-faced if you're trying to punch into that gap. As for safety, the Discovery Sport wears a five-star ANCAP badge, having been tested in 2014 when it first launched. Maintenance is covered via Land Rover's prepaid service plans, which come in at $1,950 for the first 100,000 kilometers traveled or 60 months of ownership, whichever comes first. It's worth factoring in the fact that maintenance costs for this car increase from that point because its service intervals are set through driving habits and conditions rather than kilometers traveled or time spent. The vehicle is only covered by a lowly three-year warranty, which is limited to 100,000 kilometers. Other brands who also play in this segment, such as Mercedes-Benz, offer a five-year unlimited kilometer warranty. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and I hope too that you subscribe to our channel. Now it's quite hard to sum up what it's been like to live with this car for three months, but I'll try to be brief. There's some great things about this car. Great cargo area, great third row for kids, second row is also good too, but there are some downfalls as well. That nine speed transmission is just not calibrated perfect in this car, and it was a little bit thirsty too. So in all honesty, if you're after something that's a little bit premium, we feel like this car lives up to the badge on the front. So if you want some space, give one of these a go, you won't be disappointed.